No, I, I didn't mean to say it. I thought she said she was probably. to pack in today um, some announcements you need to just be aware of and so uh, I'll ask your attention please some of you have in front of you if you don't hear some up here uh, Pastor Larry is of course you know leaving us particularly as we uh, unmethodize um, and so uh, he will be preaching on June the 4th, will be his last Sunday that he's uh, in front of you, so to speak. He'll still be available to support us as needed during that time. Um, right now, my guess is with some of the latest papers we got this week that probably on June the 12th, we will officially cut off as a Methodist church. That, that's what it looks like at this point now. That may change a little bit, but just to make you aware. Um, so some prayer concerns that just to make you aware. Mark, would you mind showing me? Yeah, problem. Um, some, some prayer concerns. Uh, we're so glad to have Vicki Lutcher with us. Uh, Jim passed away last week, and so we're just so thankful to have Vicki with us today. And uh, welcome back, Vicki. And uh, also want you to pray for Josh Hamrick, a young man that went into the Army. So he's in boot camp now. And so... Uh, be praying for Josh <laughs> along the way uh, as, as we continue to work through that. Um, other than that, just make you aware of a couple of things that are happening. Youth is, uh, is, is uh, we're combined service today and the youth are uh, doing the entire service. And so I know some of you have got all kinds of things going on in your life. Cancel them and stay for, for service. Okay? <laughs> uh, it will well be worth it and, and they would love your support as well. Now, today's lesson um, I am taking executive privilege and I'm doing a do over from last week. So, the, the outline that you see today is about two thirds of an overlap, not completely, but a little bit of an overlap. At the bottom of your outline are, are three things that I want you to note today water into wine. The baptism of Jesus and calling of the first disciples. These are the three uh, sermonettes that you'll be receiving today from the youth. Uh, they're, they're each There's three different youth that are speaking today, so uh, I think that'll be exciting. And um, our youth director, Jonathan Holland, has done a great job of putting that together for us. And so those three topics are what they're going to be covered today. So I would solicit your prayers in advance of that. Um, as those young people remember, this may be one of the first times they've ever spoken in front of a group. And so it's kind of exciting to see that. Um, now, today's lesson. Uh, because. No, I do. Yes. Stacy has an announcement. Please give her three seconds of your attention. I've got a notebook I'm going to pass away. I don't need yard party help. Gates, pies, dishwashers, busters. Potato washers, because we got 500 potatoes to wash. Um, I brought you up in the ship. I'm going to pass it around. Please put your name down so I know who I can count on to be here and help me. Yeah, you said potato washers. Washers. We got to okay. wash the potatoes. Okay. So oh, washers. Okay, we got washers. And if somebody wants to wash, you can participate too. Okay. All right, very good. So here's the deal for today. Um, Last Sunday, we, the topic was from Matthew 5, 13 through 20, 
and it was dealing with uh, salt and light and Jesus being the, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And because we rushed last week, um, we missed some things that I think were kind of important. So I want to I want to backtrack a little bit, and uh, and I really want you to kind of to follow along today because this is uh, some of this is centrality. So think of the term centrality means central or in the core of, and and it is some of this is very core to some of your understanding of uh, let me use the churchy term theology here okay and and so I really want to make sure that we visit that today so we, we talked last week about how do we lose our, our taste or our sight and in some cases it's uh, it's a very drawn out process to where it's uh, it, it takes a long time to notice that you lose those things okay it just is a, a, a very slight grade that we walk down until we find out we're at the bottom um, and in some cases, it's, it's very dramatic, right? Um, but I think it's important that you recognize in your faith walk that um, I, I'm one of those people that you're either, you're either growing or you're dying, right? Uh, that's just the way I see life. And so um, I, I think that can be said about how you are growing in your faith. You're either growing or you're atrophy right uh you're either getting stronger or you're getting weaker very seldom will you just stay in one place okay um, so i just challenge you a little bit to think about that now uh, look i'm not going to tell you that that is purely scriptural there are a lot of scriptures in, in the bible that talk about growth and about uh, maturity, and so I think that lends to that argument. Now, um, we know why Jesus used these metaphors. I know I'm moving quickly, but I want to get to the core here. We know why Jesus used this term saltiness um, or light because of what it meant to that, that group during that day. Uh, remember, salt was a value. It was uh, highly sought after, um, and it was actually an item that was traded. Roman soldiers were paid in salt in some of the some areas of the kingdom or of the uh, the Roman Empire. Um, now, why did Jesus teach about the law and the prophets? Now, uh, grab your Bibles and let's go back to Exodus, okay? Um, and and I'm going to take you back to to help you to see a little bit of of this concept of why he talked about the law and the prophets. So your, your subtitle will probably be the Ten Commandments. Now, if you were really a devout Jew, um, they're not in the same order. In fact, their first commandments, nothing sort of like what, what we talked about because they really combined the beginning of this whole concept here uh, about I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Um, it really is a concept that, that God was teaching the people during that day. I don't believe it's a mistake that Jesus refers to the law and the prophets again. So think of this. When, if you're a Jew, when he says the law, they understand that's Moses, right? And if you're really a, an old-fashioned Jew, it would also be Samuel. Samuel and Moses are considered law givers. <clears throat> But today, in Christian theology, we talk about the law being Moses, right? And the prophets were summarized by Elijah, um, but it meant all the prophets, including the minor prophets, okay? Uh, so I just want you to appreciate that to a Jew of Jesus' day, they had uh, the Tanakh. They had uh, the Greek term would be Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, um, and it was really kind of their focus so the exodus story where they received the ten commandments would have been central to their understanding now in the world today it doesn't matter what religion you are or culture you are if you're read at all if you're aware of most anything you've heard of the ten commandments right it's kind of a, a core moral law um, early English law 
was based off of the Ten Commandments. American law was basically derived from English law. Okay, so that's why today Ten Commandments is still conversation that takes place in legislatures and even some legal jurisdictions. Okay, it's the concept, right? The, the Ten Commandments are so important. But what I want you to understand is that the Jews, they were struggling to understand, and God was tr struggling to get them to understand that um, he gave them the Ten Commandments to give them ways of living and of how to develop their faith. Like we all do, we take a rule, we take a regulation, we take a law, and we expand on it, right? Because we want to make sure you understand it or... Or, uh, I mean, why do preachers take uh, maybe 20 or 30 words in scripture and then talk for 25, 30 minutes, right? Because we, we think you don't understand those 15, 20, 25 <laughs> words. So we got to tell you about it, right? And because we like to hear ourselves talk. And so at the end of the day, um, what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did is they began to take the Ten Commandments and expand it so that people could apply it to all aspects of their life. So they took those 10 commandments and they came up with um, another whole bunch of laws, okay? Over 600 different laws and commands they derived from the original 10 commandments. And they got to the point of where, um, you know, they were silly. They were just absolutely silly in the way that they approached things. How many steps you can take on a Sabbath day if you, if you take one more step than that, 1,200, I believe it was, if you made more than 1,200 steps, then you were no longer righteous, right? You had broken the law. And so remember when Jesus is saying all these things that Stacey is going to read to us in just a minute, um, these people are used to knowing I'm a lawbreaker. I never can get it straight. The people at church, their synagogue, must not like me because I never get it right. Yeah, they they well they they many of the Pharisees were very uh, fastidious. They were uh, they were very uh, uh, righteous. They they applied the law very carefully. Okay, to the point of when I am so dialed in to twelve hundred steps, I'm going to look at you and say, "Wait a minute! I saw you a while ago. You were ahead of me." You've broken the law, right? So they became the judges of the people. They became the people who uh, would look at others and say, you know, how dare you? Um, you aren't clean. And so they became people who became critical of those who were trying desperately to understand where do I fit in in God's kingdom, right? Now, why am I spending this time telling you this? Because look, um, I'm guilty of that myself. You know, I, I, I study scripture and I understand it and I want to be faithful to it. And sometimes I find myself looking at other people and saying, you know, they're not being faithful. They're not being true, right? So it's human nature to be like the people of Jesus' day. And that's why he's trying to tell them all these things. And that's why this is so important that we kind of put our arms around this. And I think it is uh, central to our faith. So. Stacy, um, as we as as she reads to you, I want you just to see. We're going to go over these, but look on your outline. The fourth point: Why did Jesus teach about the law and the prophets? So remember, Exodus twenty and one through seventeen gives you the Ten Commandments, right? So you take the Ten Commandments, and for them, the whole of Scripture, the whole of Scripture, is basically, um, let's just say, your Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament, right? Jesus was talking about the past, the present, and the future. We're going to get to this. He's, Jesus is the fulfillment of all this. But I want you to understand in a moment, we're going to talk about a dietary and ceremonial law, civil law, and moral law. But now listen to what Jesus tells the people, Stacy. I'm reading Matthew, not Exodus. That's correct. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, ma'am. So now, uh, hopefully you kept your finger there. If not, you can find it again. If you go back to Exodus chapter 20, and uh, I want you to recognize, we've talked about this, but I want you to recognize symbology of this. Okay? So the first four of the Ten Commandments is man's relationship to God. Okay? You should have no other gods before me, right? So look at them. You should have no other gods before me. Exodus 20. Um, you won't make a graven image, is what some of your translations will say. You know, no other image or idol will be before me. Uh, don't take the Lord's name in vain, right? Not to misuse the Lord's name. And then remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, okay? That's the first four. And then the next six deal with horizontal relationships. And that is relationships with other people, right? So now think about that as you, as you begin to think about the Ten Commandments. And what's interesting is, what's interesting, there's almost no places in the gospel where Jesus deals with this part. Okay, almost no. Now, he does talk about the Lord, the God, the holiness. He does all that, but he doesn't really directly address the commands, those four commandments. He spends all this time talking about those six relationships to one another. Okay, now here's why that's important the Ten Commandments didn't disappear when Jesus. Uh, when Jesus was crucified on the cross. In fact, they kind of became emboldened. They became more alive. They became more of, instead of something that you, you look at on a wall and plaque and begin to focus on, these are the Ten Commandments I got to keep at all costs. They then become something that we start recognizing that they are about a relationship and, and that they are all about how we interact with God and with others, okay? So that's why Jesus says that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, last week, we, we used the term here that he came, he didn't come to annul, okay? Like annul a marriage, uh, annul a contract. He didn't come to, to get rid of them. He came to complete them. And when he said that, the Jews kind of missed the point, right? Because they couldn't get their arms around it. As many Christians today, we sometimes are guilty of this too, that we begin to classify the Old Testament as a God of wrath, a God of judgment. We see the Old Testament, if we haven't read it in, in its entirety, and, and we read it in the context, we, we see that God is a God of all these rules, right? There are still people today who won't come to church or will leave church because they feel church is nothing but rules and laws, right? And Jesus was saying, I've taken care of all that. When he said he fulfilled it, he meant that all those things you've been thinking about and dwelling on and focused on and judging them are not as important as what my message is, right? So we have to hear that. Does that mean that um, our new church, if we came up with statement of faith, we came up with the bylaws that you approve, uh, 
they are there because yes, you have to have some order. You have to have some some basic roadmap, if you will, of how you're going to get to places. And when you get to a stop sign, uh, what do you do at the stop sign? Uh, you know, if it's a four way stop, who goes first? You got to figure those things out, right? That's kind of a natural thing. But you don't want to develop a, a process that shuts the door and locks it so that nobody from the outside can come in, right? And to the Jew of Jesus' day, that's what they did a lot of. They shut the door and people couldn't come through because you made too many steps on the Sabbath. Because, you know, you did this and you broke this law. And so we don't want to become those kind of people, right? So then the second point I want you to grab here is this concept of the whole of Scripture. Okay, um, the best commentary on the Bible is, Kim, the gospel. Oh, we don't know the word. I was listening. <laughs> I was writing something. Look, I was writing something. Okay. All right, let's, let's, let's have a duel, okay? <laughs> Kim, the, the word according the, to Doug Rinker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's the second the best, best answer. Yeah. The, the first best answer. Well, they're making points here. Okay? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm she earned points and I'm leaving her alone. <laughs> so the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. Okay? Uh, because if you if you want to understand what the Bible says, you have to appreciate that the Bible describes itself. It, it develops itself. It answers itself. The Old Testament fits best when it's with the New Testament. The New Testament is most completed when the Old Testament is wrapped into it. So when Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, he's telling you that he has completed what they were trying to do, right? And that's what needs to be central to our faith. So when we want to pull something out of Exodus, and then we want to try to apply it to something that Jesus says, it does make sense and it's good. <laughs> But you have to understand that the way that you put those two together is the glue that holds them together is Jesus. Okay, He holds it together, right? So the whole of Scripture is we have to appreciate the context of when we read things in the whole of Scripture, not just one part. Okay, because that's an argument that's easy to to break. It's an argument that's easy to to finish and win. Because I grab something out of scripture and I pull it out of context and I beat you over the head with it. And then everybody says, well, he was quoting scripture. And it may or may not be true. It may or may not be accurate because of the way I pulled it out. Okay? So just appreciate that as you go through this. All right? Now let's look at past, present, and future. So in the past of the Jewish day, let's take it from when Jesus was saying these words. The Jews had been struggling ever since they came out of slavery in Egypt to understand how to live. They lived in an area of the world where everybody had multiple gods, polytheistic, many gods, right? They were polytheistic, and they just spent all of their time looking at other nations saying, well, they're doing so much better than us. How come our God isn't doing this for us? So they have a tendency to have fought through these kind of things. And you have to appreciate that if you're a Jew in Jesus' day, people are traveling through your country. The Romans are living there. And you're hearing about all these other things that are happening in other faiths. And it's easy to start doubting your own faith because they were mainly disconnected from their faith. In, in part because some of the religious leaders kept them disconnected. Some of it was their own fault because they wouldn't get plugged in. And I'm telling you that that's Jesus Day and it's 2023 too. We have people who unplug or disconnect from church. Uh, they still may come. Okay. We used to have a saying at work. Um, you know, it's one thing for somebody to quit and leave. It's another thing for them to quit and stay. <laughs> yeah. Now we have to help them. <laughs> now we have to help them get there. We have to help them connect the dots, right? And so that's sometimes what happens in church too, is, is people will come, they'll still put money in the offering plate, but they disconnect. All right. 
they're still coming, but they quit. And that may or may not apply to me. I'm not pointing fingers. In fact, I hate to even look because I make eye contact with somebody. That they don't talk to. <laughs> uh, well, after the performance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I think we have to remember that it's it's one of those things that he's talking about their past. He's talking about the present, but more than anything, Jesus is talking about the future. Think about your faith walk too. All of us have a past. We're trying to figure the present out. And we're not sure about the future. Jesus wants to take care of all three for us. That's the amazing thing about having a God who is not bound by time. Because he can take care of the past even though it's already happened. We call that forgiveness, right? And, and so he takes care of the present because he helps us to see the picture. And in the future, by faith, we recognize that he's going to be with us. So think about that concept. Now, there were, depending on which scholar you read, um, four primary sets of laws. I usually say three. One would be dietary or ceremonial law is a lot of the Old Testament, particularly Leviticus, if you go there. Uh, you see some of it in Exodus, primarily Leviticus, but other parts of the Old Testament. Um, the Jews began to develop this concept of dietary and ceremonial law. God gave them a lot of those laws because they were moving into a land of paganism, um, a land where they had temple prostitutes in other religions. Um, a land where these people literally would take their firstborn child and they would burn the child alive, you know. Um, so when you when you hear about Molech in the Old Testament, that was the God where they literally would take the baby. Usually the firstborn male would be the sacrifice and they would take that baby and put it the, the, the idol had a big opening in its belly and its arms were fixed and they would take the baby there and it would just roll into the fire. Okay. Today we call it abortion. But, what was but the back then but back then they called it the baby worship, right? So I just want you to appreciate that God saw all of this and his people who had been slaves 40 years before <laughs> were going into this land. Okay. They had been slaves for almost 400 years. Yes, Kim? We do that with war. Today. With what? War. With war? Yeah. Yeah, we send all sons and daughters, yeah. So, um, so appreciate that God is working with the people that's in this kind of a land, okay? Um, they have all kinds of animals that these other people eat, all kinds of medical issues because... Think about it. In those days, um, pork was very difficult to raise without diseases in it, uh, trichinosis and other, other kind of diseases. And so God is telling them not to, not to participate in the diets of, of their neighboring countries, right? So there's a lot of reasons why you have all these rules in the Old Testament and laws. When Jesus came after Jesus' death, there are no more sacrifices. He was the final sacrifice, right? The dietary laws disappeared. In fact, if you go to the book of Acts, um, you know, Peter is presented with this dream and this trance that he has. And, and the fact of that God says, whatever I have created is clean to eat. Okay, so God himself gets rid of dietary and ceremonial laws. The next two laws, civil and moral. Um, the civil laws didn't change dramatically. Right. Um, yeah, they they kind of developed early on. You know, <clears throat> God had to make laws for these people. Again, remember, they're slaves. They were slaves, still slave mentality. Four hundred years of being slaves. It's always, uh oh, something's happened. They stand and wait for their master to tell them what to do. Kind of like marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Um, well said about that. Don't say anything, Doug. Keep going. Okay. Did I say that out loud? 
So, um, so appreciate, appreciate that God had to develop some civil law for them. Okay. If you have a bull and it gets out and it gores one of the neighbor's cows, then who's responsible for the payment of that? And what's the payment supposed to be? That's actually in scripture, right? God helped develop civil laws. Yes, Kim. Yeah, it was uh, it was one of those things that uh, you know it wasn't a vacuum. But appreciate that when God was doing most of this, they were dealing really with all kinds of bizarre neighbors. Okay, the Canaanites in particular were were very bizarre people, um, and so all these other gods were in here. So. Uh, the civil law kind of stands still, uh, even today, that many was it started, you know, okay, if, if you were a farmer today and your bull got into the other neighbor's pasture and, and, uh, and, and injured one of the animals, we have civil law that takes care of that, right? We, we have laws that kind of take care of that. The one that stood, though, is Jesus did not get rid of the moral law, okay? The moral law didn't change, so if you look at the Ten Commandments, particularly the last six that deal with how we interact with each other, that's why it's still the basis of a lot of legal and a lot of moral laws in civilized countries today is because those six things really make good sense, right? You shouldn't murder. You shouldn't steal. Okay? Those, those kind of stand today through all times, right? So when Jesus said that he fulfilled the law, and the prophets. He's saying he took care of all the details there. We don't need to sacrifice in the way that the Jews did it, which is why when the new church forms, we don't have a big uh, uh, a big uh, basin at the front that we bleed out lambs and doves and those kind of things, and then we cook them up and you all get to have a barbecue off to the side, and, and I get to take a third of it home, and then we burn up the other third for sacrifice. Okay, uh, we'll wait until July to do that. We're not gonna do that again. All right. So, so what you have to appreciate is is that Jesus is saying He fulfills it. Okay, and that's a really big deal. So you wonder why the religious leaders hated Jesus? They're understanding what He's saying. So now we got. He's a threat to authority. He's a threat to authority. Okay. But now you know why the people are following him by the hundreds or even thousands in some cases, because they're saying, wait a minute, he, he's telling me that all this stuff I've been worried about isn't really that important. Now he starts telling me that I matter, you know, and that that God is my God, right? It's pretty cool stuff. All right. So then we'll skip how did a Jew expect to get to heaven because um you know, it was, uh, you're going to think I'm trying to be cute, but it really was a hope and a prayer, okay? If I'm a Jew, it's kind of a hope and a prayer I'm going to get to get to heaven because I hope that I've gotten all the laws right, and I'm praying that God saw all the good times, and maybe he wasn't looking when I did them not well, okay? That's that's kind of the, the only way they're going to get to heaven. Yes, ma'am. Did they write those 600 plus laws down? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, how could they remember also? Well, if you were a typical person, you really didn't. <laughs> you just waited for a Pharisee to come along and kind of condemn you, right? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, or you things. waited to go to, to church <laughs> services, synagogue, mm -hmm. and then you would hear somebody condemn somebody else, and you would think, boy, I'm glad they saw them and not me, right? And so you just tried to do the best you could. Now, Here's where I want to spend some focus. What did Jesus say to turn this on its head? Um, so think of this. When he gives this lesson, he's beginning the lesson. He didn't finish it. So the entirety of the Gospels, all four Gospels, when you add them together, that's where you begin to see the fulfillment of all that. He's telling you about the fulfillment. He's not, Jesus not only telling you, he's modeling it. Okay? He's modeling it. And he's also demonstrating it. So think of that. He's doing all of that today. Now, here's some scriptures. We're not going to have a chance to go through all of it today. 
Um, you can write them down. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we we'll probably will have time to go to Hebrews 1. Let's see, that's 1 through, yeah, 1 through 3. <laughs> um, Acts 4, 12. Hebrews again, uh, I prefer, these are deliberately in an order, by the way. Uh, there's no wrong if you want to read both these, but you read this in between, it helps fill in the blank a little bit. Um, Hebrews 10, 19 through 23. And um, Romans 10. And this is pretty, pretty long, but it's worth a read. 1 through 13. Okay. Now, why are all these scriptures in the entirety? Because they explain a lot of, of, of what we kind of <clears throat> look at it, go from. Um, so I want you to appreciate that Jesus is turning things on its head. Because again, to a Jew, I have all of these processes, all of these laws of righteousness that I have to adhere to in order to be in line with what God is, is wanting from me. And then Jesus comes and turns it on the head because he said, look, you, uh, <coughs> you've been following after man's law, man's interpretation. And now I want to show you a new way. And so look what he says to him in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except to me. So all of a sudden, if I'm a Jew, I don't have to be like the Pharisees. I have to be like the guy that is the pathway. And, and all of a sudden, uh, we begin to see that the new guy with the real plan has meals with prostitutes, he eats with tax collectors. He hangs around with the people in the street. Um, apparently, he touches the lepers. Uh, you know, he just does everything that the church leaders of the day weren't interested in. Okay? So now if you think about your faith walk, think about it's different, right? This is what church has always said to me. Now, this is maybe what Jesus is saying to me. I'm trying to stretch you a little bit here. Think about, I don't know what that call is in your life, but maybe God's calling you out there, okay? Um, and so appreciate that he's telling them something entirely new. Let me skip ahead to, to Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us, to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And he added purification, or he provided purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So the writer is telling us that Jesus fulfilled it all. Okay? So again, you can kind of go through Acts 4.12 says, uh, salvation is found in no one else but Christ alone, right? And sometimes you can say it this way, uh, it is through Christ alone, in Christ alone, and by Christ alone, okay? It's not something that you do, right? Because if it is, if it's based on how much money I put in the offering plate, how many hours I pray, how many hours I study, how many hours I do good things in the community, I've suddenly become kind of a Pharisee, and I've suddenly become, I have this checklist that I have to do, and then Jesus, the, 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 the offering on the cross doesn't mean as much, because now it's up to me, it's 
that's what I'm doing, right? God says, Jesus says, it's not. It's faith, faith alone, all right? So so what is the plan? Um, last week, we, we, we just arched over this way too quick for my liking at the end of the day. It's bothered me all week, so that's why I want to come back here. So what is the plan? And, and so on your outline, I said for everyone and for believers. Uh, so for everyone, Jesus is saying, this is your understanding that God is available to everyone by faith, okay? Which is a new message to the people of that day. And I got to tell you, it's a message for a lot of people today. There are a lot of people who will say to you, remember when people... If you ask a friend, hey, uh, uh, love you, love for you to come to church with me sometime. They say, nah, I, I don't want to go there. Okay. Oh, really? Well, why not? Well, it's just a bunch of hypocrites to go there. Okay. So look, I know you may be offended by that because they just called you a hypocrite. But you're not as big of a hypocrite as I am. So it shouldn't bother you that much. But, but the reality is, is that they're, they're trying to articulate, but they don't know how to articulate. So instead of being offended by what they said to you, you try to see through that and just help them to understand that, look, it's okay. We can use another one. <laughs> <laughs> just join the rest of us, okay? Because we all fall short, right? We all mess up. We, we, none of us are perfect. And, and so just appreciate that, that when, when we begin to talk about everyone gets invited, Jesus was talking to everyone, okay? In the Sermon on the Mount, it's thought that there were somewhere of 5,000 plus people that were in the crowd, okay? So let's go with that number. Now, unfortunately, ladies, sorry about this. Um, more than likely, whoever gave you that number, that was men only, all right? So if that's the case, were there 10, were there 12, were there 15, regardless. But he's talking to every facet of the world there. There are non-Jews in the crowd. There, by this time, there's people like tax collectors and prostitutes and street people and, and people who have never gone to synagogue since they were kids who are there and they're listening to him and he's telling them all the same story. Okay, so that becomes our story today. Everyone is welcome. Everyone becomes welcome at Grand Hill, right? Everyone. Doug, yes. There was a Roman soldier. Perfect. Exactly. Roman Roman soldiers, some in uh, full uh, military garb, all the way to incognito, right, in disguise. So yeah. Yeah. Now, here's what I want you to recognize. So, what's the plan for believers? Jesus talked about both in here, and it's a little subtle, but I want you to get it today. Because when he's really talking in Matthew, he begins to talk about, you've heard it was said, right? And he uses that phrase a lot. But I, but I really want you to appreciate that he's talking for those who have been disfranchised, who feel neglected, who feel unworthy. But he's also talking to those who are deep in their faith. He's talking to both. Yes, ma'am. If there was that many people there, how did they all hear what he said? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I'm going to take 30 seconds. There's, there's a couple of thinkings there. One is that they call that some of the greatest unrecognized miracles of the day. Have to be. That, he, that all could hear. But also appreciate that on the plane where he was, by the very nature, it was like an amphitheater. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you, uh, any of you ever been to Red Rocks? near Denver. It's an amphitheater, a natural amphitheater cut out of the rocks. Uh, the, the acoustics are so fantastic. You can stand on the stage and pretty much everybody hears you um, in, in your presentation. So that's the thing. Now, so how will goodness manifest itself? Um, this is important, folks. Goodness manifests itself through the power of the Holy Spirit, but guess what? who the Holy Spirit uses? Yeah. So goodness will manifest itself in the world today through the power of the Holy Spirit through us, okay? Now, you can say through them, but it's not right. It's through us, right? Not just me, 
not just you, but us, all right? So then what is the value of goodness? We talked about this quickly last week. Um, I, I use the term show, tell, and do, okay? When you teach a lot of times, uh, I'll show you something. Now you tell me what I just told you. Now you do it, okay? That's one of the best ways to, to, to train, particularly in, in anything that requires aptitude and, and repetition. So show, tell, and do. Um, I also wrote this down for you. What then is the value of goodness? Um, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. So here's how you may have someone say it to you if they're really, they're, they're doubting their faith or maybe even your faith. Don't tell me about it. Show me. Okay. So um, words are important, but actions often are more important. Okay. So um, we left with what could you do to add salt or light to the world uh, last week? And we talked about a few things, but here's the challenge I really want you to, to grab onto this week is what does that look like for you? And how will you add salt and light to the world? You know, it's, it's a challenge that our church board, uh, those 11 individuals who are elected by you to, to administrate the new church, um, you know, they're really wrestling with what does it look like in their ministry. We have seven areas of ministry now that we're focused on. We'll be talking more about that in the future um, as we go along. So uh, be ready for next week. We're talking about uh, three great topics all at one time. Um, that probably will be my last sermon to you because you'll fire me after that. Anger, lust, and divorce, okay? And we're going to time all together because it's the three great things to talk about in church, right? <laughs> Anger, lust, and divorce. I'm looking forward to it. Let's end the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the prayer concerns that this church has and for the people that are looking to you, Lord, for comfort and for peace. Give us all your comfort and peace, Lord. And Lord, right now, we just ask your special blessing on our young people of our church, particularly in the next hour ahead as they lead us in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week. Thank you.